Hello, I am Eli Adashi, Professor of Medical Science at Brown University and host of Medscape One on One. Joining me today is Dr. Tom Frieden, Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, whose earlier tenure as the Commissioner of New York City's Health Department was marked by visionary accomplishments. Our topic, Winnable Public Health Battles. Welcome. Thank you. It's wonderful to have you with us today. Let's begin with tobacco. How does one account for the fact that one in every five adults still smokes and that progress has stalled over the last four years? Is it that we're up now against the true hardcore smokers, or is there much more to it than that? Well, tobacco is addictive, and most smokers began smoking as kids. Most smokers want to quit, and in fact, we're not up against the hardcore smokers overall. What we see is that places in the U.S. that implement effective policies continue to see big declines in tobacco use. So the things that worked before continue to work. We have to implement them and implement them more effectively. So the packages and the know-how, they're here. The secret is applying them effectively and conscientiously. Absolutely. Yeah. We've seen a lot of progress with smoke-free public places. We're seeing uh, not good developments with running hard-hitting ads. It's expensive to do that, but they work. But there's good news with coverage of cessation treatment and with more options for people who want to quit. Every doctor should be an advocate for tobacco cessation. Speaking of smoke-free spaces, uh, where would you say are we on the whole as a nation uh, towards becoming a smoke-free nation as appears to be the norm in New York City? Well, mm -hmm. the glass is far more than half full, but it's still partly empty. We've seen a steady expansion in smoke-free places around the country and, in fact, around the world. But still, last year, 90 million Americans were regularly exposed to secondhand smoke, and shockingly, most children are exposed to secondhand smoke. And for parents who smoke, they should be aware that 98% of kids with a parent or guardian who smokes have measurable levels of tobacco toxins in their bodies. So don't kid yourself. If you smoke, quit. And if you think your kids don't notice, well, they're twice as likely to become smokers themselves, and they're virtually certain to be exposed to toxic chemicals. My last read of the figures suggests that due to first and second hand smoking exposure, one individual dies every minute in the United States. Is that a correct and up to date figure? There are more than 400,000 deaths per year from tobacco. That's more than a thousand each and every day of the year. It remains the leading preventable cause of death in this country and in fact globally. And therefore everyone in the health field really should be advocates for tobacco control. And that means control in the community through measures such as hard-hitting ads, smoke-free places, and increasing the price of tobacco, and prevention in the healthcare setting helping smokers quit, advising each and every smoker personalized, forceful, specific information and advice to quit. It makes a big difference. It can be discouraging for doctors because most people that we encourage them to quit, they don't. But what an individual clinician may not recognize is that that three to five minutes of personalized advice doubles the likelihood that a smoker will quit. So it sounds as if a whole series of individually important but complementary measures really are ultimately what makes the difference. Absolutely. And, uh, and in parts of the country and parts of the world where they've been applied, we've seen smoking rates fall and fall rapidly. Looking forward, 
Uh, can one point to recent pharmacological or technological innovations that would perhaps add to our set of tools as we seek to promote smoking cessation? Is there anything on the horizon that is quasi-revolutionary or at least a game changer? Well, first, there are great tools today, and there are an increasing number of options for smokers who want to quit. Medication, different forms of nicotine, different combinations. Uh, personally, I think that every smoker who tries to quit and sees a health care professional should get cessation assistance, medications. But really, currently, only about one in ten do. So better use of existing tools is very important, and it's encouraging that we have more medications that are available, more forms of nicotine replacement that are available, and more ways to potentially use combinations of medications. In the future, we uh, would be very excited by some things on the horizon, maybe more effective medications, maybe even a vaccine. But that's theoretical. Right now, what's practical is that smoking is killing people, and we can help them quit. So really pragmatism and the utilization of existing approaches seems to be the way to go. In fact, uh, for the first time over the past few years, the trend has been that now most Americans who've ever smoked have already quit. So if you've got a patient who thinks they can't quit, you can tell them most smokers already have and you can too. That's a significant message. Let's move on now to obesity, another hopefully winnable battle. Drawing on your experience in New York City, has menu labeling had the desired impact on food choices that adults make for themselves, but perhaps even more importantly for their children? Menu labeling is uh, an important intervention. It empowers people. It gives them information. It also is important because it gets the restaurants to think twice before they put up a 1,500 calorie breakfast. And, uh, so it, it both um, makes the choices healthier and it makes the options healthier by getting some reformulation on the part of the restaurant industry. And uh, I think we would say that it's a modestly effective intervention. The data from New York City suggests that people did reduce the amount of calories they consume as a result of menu labeling by and large. But, for example, one restaurant chain had a price discount mm -hmm. where they had an inexpensive, a foot-long, five-foot sandwich. Uh, sorry, foot-long, five-dollar sandwich. <laughs> and that foot-long, five-dollar sandwich resulted in a big increase in calories consume, consumed per uh, customer. So informational efforts like menu labeling are important. They empower people. They hold restaurants accountable to an extent to what they're doing, but they can be overwhelmed by other factors such as price. Now, as you may know, in 2012, menu labeling becomes the law of the land, and every restaurant throughout the U.S., uh, will need to um, have, uh, if they're a chain restaurant, will need to have the calories prominently displayed. And that uh, is being articulated by the Affordable <coughs> Care Act that was signed into law uh, not all that long ago, really six months ago, uh, to be precise. Where do trans fats uh, or trans fats reducing initiatives fit into the mix? Do you think of it in the context of anti-obesity regimens, or more simply as a wellness-promoting regimen? Well, elimination of artificial trans fat is a specific improvement in nutrition that's possible. It will definitely reduce heart attacks. Whether it reduces obesity is really not proven. There's some evidence that suggests it might, but whether or not it does, it will drive down heart attacks substantially. Uh, the estimates are in the tens of thousands per year. What we've seen nationally is real progress, a substantial reduction in the amount of artificial trans fat that is in the food supply. We now need to take stock of what's left and how can we further reduce it. Uh, trans fat is a real success story, and I think the food industry, although they were reluctant at first, now sees that it didn't cost money, it wasn't complicated, by and large, 
some products. It took some reformulation. It didn't reduce the availability. Um, and in fact, it's quite feasible. Extending that line of thinking now and moving to sodas, which I know you have had significant interest in, has a meaningful soda tax been to date convincingly shown to be an effective anti-obesity measure? And in that context, uh, has any municipality or state actually been able to accomplish this feat? The first thing we know is that Americans drink far too much soda, and not just soda, but other sugar-sweetened beverages, sugary drinks. We consume about 250 or 300 calories more per day, per person, than we did a few decades ago. And nearly half of that in, uh, increase is in sugar-sweetened beverages. So I don't think there's any debate that we need to reduce the amount of sugar-sweetened beverages that we consume. That's why we're getting them out of schools, we're getting them out of daycares, we're getting them out of the vending machines that are in schools. We'd like to, we've seen actually real progress of the industry in advertising less to young children at least. So there's widespread consensus that we need to reduce the amount of sugar drinks that we consume. And learning from tobacco, there are a few things that work. Um, marketing restrictions work. Having access to water, and healthy drinks works as an alternative. And price is very important. So when we see in the supermarket um, five or 10 liters for just a couple of dollars, we know that that's going to drive up consumption. The data on the price responsiveness in soda is quite strong, and it's largely mm -hmm. from the industry. So the lower the prices, the higher the consumption. The higher prices, the lower the consumption. There has not yet been anywhere in the country a community that's gotten a soda tax implemented that's at a level high enough that we would expect it to possibly reduce consumption. And it's really up to each community to decide how they want to address the obesity epidemic. Would it be fair to say that by all accounts, this is a very sensible measure, but that the ultimate experiment has not as yet been done in terms of seeing the impact of such on obesity. Would that be a fair statement? No community has reversed the obesity epidemic. So we're seeing now communities throughout the U.S. and throughout the world considering, debating, trying to apply new strategies. And whatever is done, what's essential is that we rigorously evaluate it so we can learn from it. Finally, um, you are taking on the all-important challenge of healthcare-associated infections. What is the battle plan? First, to understand that these are unacceptable. We now have the technology to eliminate a large proportion of healthcare-associated infections, and we need to do that. And we need to do it not just in the short term, but sustainably. And there are very encouraging data from around the U.S. of systems that have driven down rates of healthcare associated infections by 70 or 80 percent and kept them at a low level. The next level of battle has to be to look hard at the ambulatory surgery centers, at long-term care facilities, at the outpatient settings such as dialysis centers and drive numbers down more. I remember when I was in training as a medical resident, we thought that line infections were just par for the course. They happened. We now know that they don't need to happen. And because they don't need to happen, we have a responsibility to prevent them. Finally, taking the broadest view possible, uh, would you care to predict where the nation might be in 2015 in its multiple public health battles? I'm optimistic that we're going to be in a much better place on prevention. We're going to have a more widespread recognition that prevention saves lives and saves money. We'll have fewer smokers. We'll have examples from communities around the U.S. of places that have reversed at least childhood obesity. We'll have a big decrease in infections associated with the health care setting. We're going to have prevention on a standard footing as under, that we understand that prevention is a core component of our health system. Not only is it good, but we need it. We need it to ensure that we have the money and the productivity and the life to be the healthiest community and country we can be. Well, if I may say so, I 
I personally believe the nation's public health is in good hands. And on that note, sincere thanks to Dr. Frieden and to you, our viewers, for joining Medscape one on one. Until next time, I am Ellie Adashi.